for today's discussion. So um, we'll, we'll be um, having arranging a test quiz at the end of this lecture, somewhere around 12, p, uh, 12 p.m. So make sure that you're, if you're online, make sure that you come in and check on the test quiz. Make sure that everyone is all, uh, aligned with uh, be able to take quizzes, uh, the real quiz uh, on Thursday. So just to rely on that. So uh, what we're going to do today is, of course, continue our discussion on chapter 10, which is differential pair. And we have already uh, discussed some, some of the uh, basic analysis on how does one analyze a large signal uh, survey, I should say, of, of a differential pair. So first of all, you need to understand whether it's at this OP meaning the operating point, where is the balance point. We're going to talk about the small signal analysis based on this balance point. But, but uh, one of the key things, uh, or it will come out in quizzes, is that the next quiz, not, not the, uh, the, the quiz six. We're going to cover six, uh, chapter six. So I'm preparing that equation, uh, questions, which are uh, a lot of them were based on understanding what happened at the balance point, what happened when before you toggle your seesaw, where, where is the actual balance point. So finding the balance point is one of the very important things in a differential pair. And then we talked about if you swing it to the maximum, what is its output swing? And its characteristic as one bias toward one direction or the opposite. And then you can uh, also need to understand the maximum branch current at each uh, biasing point or, or at each uh, regime, uh, extreme. When you operate exceed the linear region, what happened as it, as it reached saturation at this particular saturation point, what are the branch currents, the maximum or minimum branch currents? So the max and the mi minimum, one should definitely understand how a large, the seesaw, the large signal behavior of a differential pair, how does it look like in terms of biasing voltage and in, in terms of biasing current. The next thing, of course, we're going to talk about at this particular bias point, the small signal, uh, has, small signal analysis is going to be based on at the center, start at the center. When you look at the center close to op operation point, so what is the characteristic mostly if you look at the large signal, it's looking at the slope of the change. Uh, it's typically the understanding of VOD and VID. So when you start wiggling the, 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 uh, from the center point, how does it change? What is the percentage change once you wiggle toward one direction? So that's the GIN. We're going to talk about that a little bit. How does one look at this and use a, a what we call the half circuit equivalent half circuit to analyze two key important things. One is its differential gain to deliver differential gain. Of course, we also want to see how well it resists noise. Therefore, you want to look at common mode gain. So there's two ways of looking at a, looking at a differential equivalent model, the, the, I should say differential equivalent circuits, and then the, uh, to do that type of analysis, we use something called the differential half circuit. And then when you look at that common mode, when you try to lift the board, what happens is that you have to look at what effectively does it respond to. So we're going to look at common mode half circuit. You can either use, uh, for common mode, uh, there's typically two ways of looking at this. You can either uh, cut it in half or fold it. Look at that as a whole, but fold it together. So we're going to look at both ways of looking at uh, common mode responses. But uh, either way, it should give you the equivalent results. So half or fold should give you the same common mode gain. And then lastly, we're going to talk about uh, differential pair with active load. This is one of the ways to, to make a, a differential in meaning that I have differential input, and then I have single end output. So we're going to talk about that. This is also very common in uh, amplifier uh, design, because in most cases, we only deal with differential signal at the beginning, as, as we talked about, is that because at the beginning, the noise get, 
tends to propagate too much. So you want to first eliminate the input noise through a, uh, through a suppression of common mode noise. And then afterwards, uh, it's already cleaned up a little bit, so you don't really care about it too much, so that you can use single end to make your life easier. Because fully differential architecture has some other um, complexities. So uh, this is like um, the way to think about it is that uh, if you have a, 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 a think about uh, if you go to your house, you have some area to clean up. You have a mat which cleaned up the dirt. When you come in, you accept that oh, everyone has a clean feet, and you don't really need to take care of the noise too much at, as it propagates into the system. So. Typically, when we take, uh, we take care of differential, if you look at differential uh, operational amplifier, the one that I uh, alluded to in the beginning of the class, which is the 741 operational amplifier, if you look at that, uh, you typically use a differential input stage and then follow up with single-ended uh, amplification. So this is the idea that when, when, when signal come in, it's the most dirty part. So you want to clean it up a little bit through a differential stage, and then you don't actually care too much because the noise has been filtered out somewhat uh, at the beginning. So we're going to use single end, and how do you transform differential input into single ended output, and how does one evaluate the, the, this differential pair rather than having fully differential architecture? So we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So we we'll go back to a little, we'll do a little review on the, the circuit that we have already discussed, which is a um, BJT, this pair. So now we're using loading here. You see that we, we're basically using a simple resistive load to just simplify the case at the beginning. As I said, in this type of large signal analysis, we typically don't uh, think about the effect of base current, meaning that we assume that um, in all operation regime of Q1 and Q2, we're assuming that for both, both Q1 and Q2, its collector is approximately equals to emitter at most cases. This is by ignoring base current. So in this type of analysis, what you, um, when one investigates its um, operation, you have differential input, meaning that you have two input, which goes uh, in opposite direction. And then I have my output, which is uh, highlights Vx, Vy. And if you look at fully differential operation, as I said, for fully differential operation, meaning that I'm taking out differential signal in the output, It will be VL will be defined as VX minus VY. And your V in ID, differential input, I should say VOD, just to be precise. So that will be my differential output. If I already define my output as differential output, and my VID will be, according to our previous being one, minus being two. So I'm not doing the inverting here. So it will still be an inverting amplifier because I'm using Vx minus Vy. So we have already did our analysis. What you will get is something. Um, I'm plotting two plots. One is you plot if we're plotting Vx and Vy, what happens is that you actually see an operation region which will then um, as a function of Vid. 
which is the difference between two input voltage. Uh, for bipolar adjunction transistor, we know that because the exponential factors in this in the control of bipolar current, because I C equals to I S exponential V B E over V T. So because of this, this exponential dependency, we'll see that if your voltage, the difference between two voltages is, in, uh, is uh, higher than 100 millivolt, you will see most of the current will go to the single branch. You will assume that, so we typically assume that if VID exceed, let's say it's larger than VID max, we assume that the current I C one will take in all current, while I C two will be approximately zero. This is also true when V I D. So this is the one boundary. The second boundary is when V I D is smaller than to go to the other end, where then you would then have Q one taking in zero current and Q2 take off, assuming that this is the case. If this is the case, then the response will look something like this. Vx, so this is just, a sum, uh, this is just from last week. So if I'm plotting Vx and Vy, so Vx will be We'll start with the balance point. Remember the balance point is when each one taking half of the current. So you have to know that your balance point is at VCC minus one half IEE. That's half of the current times whatever load. So starting from the balance point, we know that once it passes, it takes all. Um, once it passes, it takes all, therefore, it would have its lowest, where it is when it takes all current, then it should be VCC. So this point should be VCC minus IEE RC. So when it takes all current, it gets to the lowest level on VX. So it gradually changes. It's not a straight line, so it has the highest gain at the center. And then it sort of flattened out, and then reach another saturation. So the other saturation is when it goes to the other extreme, when IC2, Q2 takes all, when Q1 has, not, has none. So this will be VCC. So this will be VCC. OK, so we know the boundaries. And then you can do that for the other side as well. So this is VX. I'm going to plot VY, use green. So VY also stand at the balance point. It goes to the opposite direction. And it goes like that. So it should have the same slope and magnitude and then flatten out. This is when uh, IC becomes IC2 becomes zero. Right? So this is this will still be VCC. This is the IC2 equals to zero. On the left is IC1 equals to zero. Right? And also, this will then go down, downwards, and then flatten out, and reach its uh, lowest level, which is when, I, when IC2 takes all, uh, Q2 takes all, I should say. IEE RC. So in this type of analysis, you should definitely know the boundaries and the extreme points. But once we have this, we should be able to plot the ultimate transfer function. So for a fully differential, let me explain again. Fully differential meaning that it's differential in, differential out. Diff in plus differential out. I'm gonna, um, the reason why I want to stress it again is because we have other type of uh, Variation meaning that it could be single ended out. So fully differential meaning differential in, differential out. So it's transfer function, the overall transfer function for a fully differential amplifier 
will be VOD versus VID. So if there's the case, I already know VID, but VOD is defined So the plot will be something like this. You center, you want to plot VID, and the response VOD. So here's defined by Vx minus Vy. So we know the boundary if you want to do the plot. You follow this uh, curve of Vx and Vy. You want to highlight the boundary. We know that this is Vid max. The point here is minus VID max. And we already illustrate that VID max is approximately, is approximately four, four times thermal voltage is approximately about 1.1 volt. So we know that for the operation version of this type of circuit, uh, for bipolar, at least for bipolar junction transistor, the operation regime, input operation range, meaning that you still get gain. At least you get a ratio. Input operation range for VID is smaller than 0.1, larger than minus 0.1 for a typical uh, differential pair, PJT uh, uh, differential pair. So, so let's look at the response. We know that when you add the balance point, when VID equals to zero, left equals to right at this particular point. So if you go to the right-hand side, what happens is that your VX, the orange, is lower than VY, so it goes lower. And then it saturates. I should, my slope doesn't look good. Okay. Doesn't, it slightly saturates. So a saturated point is v, Vx minus Vy. This is the difference between the two is I minus, the level is minus IEE RC. Okay? If I'm going above, the most positive swing I can get is IE RC. Okay? So ultimately, the maximum swing, if I ask you the maximum output swing, this will be in the next quiz, uh, the quiz six. Maximum output swing is defined as VO max, VOD max minus VOD minimum. So this is um, VOD max is IE ERC minus IEE -E minus minus I. So you get two times IEE RC. -E okay? So to, to make sure that you could have the maximum swing, I forgot to mention one thing is that you have to make sure that the lowest point, at this particular lowest point, you're still higher than, um, higher than its uh, minimum level of this particular point. So in all the differential operation region, we have the assumption, we assume that at at uh, each stream, you assume that Q1, Q2 re remains active at, at the saturated level. Saturated level is uh, minus IE. RC or IE RC. That is to say that the maximum uh, swing is controlled by the, the current steering rather than the transistor itself. So you want to make sure that even though you're swinging to the maximum, the transistor is still inactive. So it's not limited. The swing is no longer limited by 
transistor rich in saturation. Remember, if I have single-ended transistors, the minimum V out that they can go will determine the Vy, the lowest V, lowest Vx or Vy will be determined by the uh, uh, a transistor whether it enters saturation or not. But in this case, it's limited by the steering, steering capability of this uh, differential pair. Therefore, typically your design is to make sure that your transistor will never go into such uh, in a good design will make sure that it will never go into saturation even at the extreme level. So this is still higher than the level required for VCE to be higher. So because we have an ideal current source, so typically that's not a problem. But if you don't have an ideal current source, that there might be some limitation as to how low it goes. But in most of the design, we would want to make sure that this is still higher than um, the higher than the level which will reach saturation, OK? So in most of the, in this analysis, we're assuming that no matter how I swing the seesaw, Q1, Q2 remain inactive so that the model will still be valid. The current equation in the model will still be valid. OK, so this is sort of a review of what we have already discussed last time in understanding the large signal analysis of a differential pair, a bipolar differential pair. So let's look at a MOSFET version. For an MOS version, it's actually slightly, um, it's actually very similar, but um, you would then have different, the only thing is that you would then uh, be able to adjust your operation, input operation range. So let's talk about that. So for a MOS diff pair, let's first draw the schematic. So that will be VDD. And we'll then have also, we're still going to use a resistive low for just a preliminary uh, investigation of differential pair. So I will have a tail current source ISS. And then for differential operation, we'll only talk about differential operation here. So for differential operation, meaning that you swing one side top, the other uh, down. So this is V in one, this is V in two. We also look at two terminals, X and Y as well. So let's say if the left side is Vx, the other side, let me get my colors. The other side is uh, Vy. We have two transistors, M1, M2. They are matched. OK? So we're going to do the same analysis as we discussed before. If you look at. Well, typically, I would like to draw the current and then the response and the voltage response. So you start with the current. You're going to do the same thing as before. So we know that if this is VID, the same definition as before. VID is V in 1. Let me just be clear. This is V in 1 minus V in 2. OK? So we always start at the balance point where VID equals to 0. This is 0. So this would then correspond to both sides balanced at the balance stage. So they share the total current. So we know that if I'm highlighting IC1 and IC2, we're expecting that IC1 and IC2 will be balanced at the same point which is half of the current. So this is one half ISS. And then for IC1, it will move as my input increase on, on the left side. I expect the current, more current will go to IC, a Q1. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. This is drain current. So it's ID. I didn't switch. ID2. Okay? 
So if I, I want to highlight the current, this is ice D1, and the other is the blue. If you want to be consistent, so the Y side will highlight by blue, so the current will be ID2. Okay? So on the left branch, which is highlighted, the left branch response is highlighted in yellow. So with an increase, and then it will, of course, saturate when it takes off. So the saturated level is when you take all, which is ISS, right? I don't know if it's balanced. It's not really balanced. So it doesn't look like one half. Okay, let me just adjust my plot so that it looks more balanced. Okay, this should be the same margin. Okay. So it drops down. The other side, if it goes on the side, is you expect it to drop. And then when Q2 takes over, you got nothing, and you reach 0. So the maximum current, if I ask you the maximum current for this differential, uh, for M1, the maximum will be ISS. The lowest amount will be 0. So the overall current swing will be ISS for each one of the transistors. If you look at the left side, still that it's the same. It will reach a saturated level. Let's say that my lines are flat. I want to make sure that's flat. OK? So this is when M2 takes the whole current, and this is when M2 has none. Okay? So you know that the current is steering between the left and the right. So one of the key important things is that at any condition, at any point, I'm just going to cut A, B, C, D, at any VID condition, either it's A, B, or C, or D, ID1 um, plus ID2 always equals to ISS. OK? What does this mean? This means that when at this particular look, at this at a point, the all current comes from all the current comes from ID two. At the B, let me cut it to the left. So at location B, part of it provided by A, part of it provided by B. But the summation, this plus this, will always equals the same. So this height is the uh, complement of this height, so that it will, the summation of both will always remain ISS at each of the locations. At the center point, half and half. At this point, this, I'm just, the point I, was, I would like to make is that this distance equals to this distance. Okay? So that this plus the, the yellow plus the green, uh, the yellow plus the blue or equals to zero, or equals to ISS. So always true at any of the operating point. OK? So the corresponding results at Vx and Vy will follow very similarly as this before. So I'm just going to call it out. Um, two colors, one in yellow. So first of all, you find your balance point. The balance point, at balance, uh, your balance level should be VCC minus one half ISS. Each takes half times RD. Okay. So you start at the balance point, and we know that VX 
uh, VS follow this uh, yellow line, meaning that the current increases, ID1 increases, therefore VX drops as ID1 increases. So it drops to the maximum level, which is VCC minus ISS RD. It will raise to the highest level when it does not have any, carry any current. <coughs> Let me look at it. I want to make sure that it's balanced. Okay. And both of them should have the same saturating point. Just so that I got the line straight. We're going to talk about the ID max for MOSFET later. Okay? So we know that at a certain point, you would then see saturating effect, ID max. VID, because a symmetric result, we expect it should be symmetric in both directions. So if you look at, so this is VX. This is v, VDD, the highest when it does not carry any current. When ID, this represents when ID1, this is when ID1 equals to zero, right? So on the other side, you will then see the same thing. So this is the center for the blue line. It goes up as its current decreases. I just make sure the boundaries are correct. So it comes down gradually, and then it goes back up like that. So it saturates at the same VDD minus ISS RD. Yeah, I'm making a mistake here. Sorry. Should be VDD. This is VDD. Your center point is VDD minus the voltage drop on the resistor. And the lowest point is when one side take all current. And this is also uh, VY at its max is VDD, where when ID2 equals to zero. This is correspond to the region where ID2 equals to zero. Okay. So we can also do the same fully differential output transfer function, which is VOD defined as VOD versus VID. So then you get the cut line, which is the, the turning point, which is VID max minus VID max. And we know that its maximum level uh, represent here. Its maximum level, if I define this as Vx minus Vy, so its maximum level happens when Vx minus Vy, which is ISS, ISS RD. And its lowest level is minus ISS RD. So it's a purely symmetrical structure. So we know that it goes like that. Okay? So this is my balance point at zero. This is balance point. And then we're going to talk about small signal Later here, this, this will represent my small signal differential gain. The slope is differential, small signal differential gain. For large signal analysis, what you care about are two things. One is, as I said, for large signal, we typically look for two things, and two important characteristics. One is saturated level. In this case, for fully differential, Saturated level is uh, IEEE RC. 
minus i e. You know that your extreme balance, extreme point, extreme output point, saturates the levels, and output swing, typically maximum output swing, and then third, you want to know your VID boundaries. So, VID max. Because it's a symmetric structure, so typically what you need to know are these three things, and that would define your curvature. Right? Your overall response. So, output swing, saturated level. I should, I should say, you start with saturated level, you know output swing. And then we, know, we need to know uh, what are the up, uh, I, BID max, where is the turning point where you reach, start to reach saturation. So remember, what does VID actually represent? We go back to bipolar's understanding is that when most of the current goes to one, set, one side of the branch. But for a differential pair, of, uh, for a mass differential pair, uh, the way to define this is that when you think about it is when VID increases and then ISS will flow through M1. So at which point ISS will be all supported by M1? So the basic idea is then you assume that your voltage on the, so this is the point where if you think about it, we're looking at this voltage difference between the two. This is actually VID, right? So VID, if you look at this uh, condition, this is VGS. And this is VGS2. So VID should depend on VID by KVL is VGS1 minus VGS2. Right? So VGS1, and at this particular point, when VID I should say when VID reaches VID max, when it just starting to reach this particular point, what happens is that you expect the current on the left should be I, uh, ID1, should take all the current, and ID2 should be zero. Okay? So for ID2 to just turn off, you expect this is just arrived. I'm saying just arriving at the zero, just turning it off, meaning that VGS2 should just reach VTH. Just close the door. So you want to know that when it starts to rise, this starts to reduce. If you look at this current, the current starts to close off just at threshold your uh, M2 starts to turn, turn off. So you expect at this turn, turning off point, your VGS should, this indicates that it just turned it off. Just turn off. So at this transition point, M2 just turned off, meaning that VGS should be right at threshold so that it starts to turn off. And then the left-hand side should take in all. So what is VGS1? So at this particular point, you have to realize that one, once again, VGS, at this particular VGS1, it should carry, it should provide ID1 equals to ISS. So we can simply use the current equation ID1 is one half mu and C ox W over L. Let's assume that it has the same. So VGS1 minus VTH squared. We're going to ignore um, Chandler's modulation effect, first order. Just going to look at first principle equations. So this will be ISS. 
OK? So we can then solve for for VGS1. So what is VGS1? VGS1 equals to threshold plus, let me write it down, 2 times ISS divided by mu and Cx w OK? So at this point, it starts to carry how, how much voltage, DC voltage, you need to apply on M2, M1, so that it could carry all the current. So the, the, the amount of overdrive you need is actually this, to carry all the current, which is ISS. So then we go back to see what we're looking for. We're looking for the VID at this particular point. So VID max is defined as at this particular point, VGS1 minus, once again, this VID equals to VGS1 minus VGS2. Minus VGS2. So that we get, get rid of the threshold. So ID max equals to 2 times ISS. Mu and Cx. Okay? So this is what we get as its uh, turning point. So if you look at this, uh, it's different from bipolar cases is because its, its sensitivity is not exponential. Its sensitivity depends on your uh, W over L the size of the transistor, and also how much you need to carry. So this is more like the overdrive of taking on all the current. Okay, So we can actually modulate this. Or you could, um, this actually equals to, if you think about it, at equilibrium, So at the equilibrium point, meaning that uh, for a differential pair, its equilibrium point is when VID equals to zero. That's your center point. When VID equals to zero, current ID1 equals to ID2 equals to IS, er, um, ISS over 2. So half of the overall tail current, this will then give us an overdrive. We, call, we define it as the overdrive of the trend, overdrive needed to carry the balanced current is actually uh, ISS. Mu and Cx, W real. This is when it needs to carry its balanced current. This is defined as the overdrive voltage to provide IDQ. IDQ is uh, operating point is the balance point. OK? So this would then suggest that our plot would look something more like this. This would then suggest that the VID max will then be defined as VOV, equivalent VOV times a factor of square root 2. Right, so the difference between the two is the square root, the ratio of square root of two. Okay, so what does this imply? This implies that I could actually, uh, different as different from a bipolar version, what happened is that this I could actually change the slope or the operation version. So let's say 
if I have a differential pair where ISS and RD are the same. OK? So that means my boundaries are the same, meaning that the highest and lowest boundary is being fixed. If I'm plotting VOD as a function of VID, if I'm plotting the overall differential transfer function, it will look something like this. And then, OK? So as I have already highlighted, this will be square root of V O V equivalent. This will be minus square root of V O V equivalent. So what if this is under a particular point where I have a fixed W rel? So one of the things you need to know that this is when, for example, this is W over L equals to maybe 10. So what if I increase my W over L, meaning that I'm increasing this level? If I'm increasing W over L, what happens is that it would then make my overdrive slightly smaller. So let me just plot the line. This is when W over L equals to 10. So what if I, let me change to another direction. So you need to um, draw a line where if, for case A, where W over L equals to 1, or case B, so this is the, um, Typical case, if you reduce your W over L, if, or if you, I increase my W over L to 100. So if you do the same plot, what happens is, as I said, because my ISS, this level doesn't move. This is ISS or D. This is minus ISS or D. So the the maximum and lowest saturating point does not move. The only thing that changes is changes is uh, VID max or overdrive equivalent uh, at, at equilibrium. The overdrive at equilibrium. So when W of L becomes smaller, this becomes smaller. What happens is that you will then experience a slope. Let me draw this. You will then have when W of L becomes smaller, V, o, uh, v overdrive becomes higher so that you will see something more like this. A curvature more like this. So the white will be case B, because my VOB, uh, VOB extended. So this will be case A, sorry. And just to be clear, this is, let's, let's just say this is case C, then this is C. And finally, for B, it will be narrower because I'm increasing my W rail. Therefore, my overdrive uh, and equilibrium, the overdrive of each uh, transistor will be smaller. It require less to provide the same amount of current so that <laughs> so that it should tighten the change. OK? So this is just to show you that my input operation region, the third parameter, the input operation region, actually changes from cases to. So for the, this is, this is the input operation for case B. And this is that for this two points allocate, um, indicate that for case C, then the white, and then the, the widest range, okay? This is for case A, where you have the smallest transistor.
。那针对 MOS 的 differential pair 的话，它就有一些空间，因为它的这个 ID max 跟 ID minimum 跟它的 overdrive 有关。这个 overdrive 指的是当你 taking 二分之 i s 就是在你的平衡点的时候的 overdrive。因为那所以当你 toggle， 就当你要拿两倍的电流的时候呢，你的电压就增加根号二倍嘛。这个是这个呃，把这个是 MOSFET current equation 的特性，所以呢，我们就会发现呢，当你改变，所以这个 overdrive 本身呢，跟你 transistor 的大小有关，所以针对 MOSFET 的 differential pair， 你就可以去设计 W over L 的 ratio。W over L 的 ratio 如果越大的话，表示什么呢？表示你的，表示你的 overdrive 越小，就是你你 W over L 越大，表示你这个 transistor 可以 take in 的 current 越大，所以你不需要这么大的电压。就可以 take in 这么大的电流，所以这个你的 input 的 operation rate 就会缩小。所以如果我的 C 是中心点，就是我一开始我设计十，如果我希望我的操作范围变大的话，我就把它把 W over 变小，那我就变成白色这条 curve。白色这条 curve 就是我可以放大我的 input operation range。当然我的缺点呢，就是我的这个斜率哈，你可以看到中心的斜率会改变。所以我当我改变 W over， 我就是会改变 G U， 大家会看到，所以它的。Overall 的 differential gain 会改变，所以你大概在设计的过程中呢，就是有一些调变的空间。这个是当你的 boundary 都设定，也就是说我的 tail current source 是固定的，我的 loading 是固定的，那我操作范围就是固定的。这个操作范围固定之后呢，那我可以调变的就是这个斜率跟它的 input 这个 operation range。所以呃，针对 MOS 的这个 diff pair 呢，你就是有这个空间可以去 design。针对 mark， 针对。BJT 呢就没有办法去控制。我们刚刚讲它的范围就是 0.1 到负零点，因为 exponential 的范围的关系。那当然也可以做，就是做 d e t e r m i n a t i o n 这个我们上次有稍微提到一点点，但是这个课我们就不讲更多。但它也有设计的空间，那它设计就要加其其他 element。那 B MOSFET 的话就直接改这个 device size， 我就可以去设计，让我的 input operation range 跟呃 differential gain 可以达到我某一个我想要的设计的规格。OK。So let's continue our discussion on small signal. So what we're, the next thing we're going to focus is on small signal, meaning that if I'm actually、uh, applying AC signal, which is a small small variation of signal, this will be typically my operation region. So I'm going to look at the small signal region, which is it does not reach when it、uh, has not reached saturation. So we're gonna focus at the at the center. The center is when BID equals zero. So you're only making a little tweak, once tilt, tilt slightly to the left or tilt slightly to the right. So we're gonna look at the small signal behavior and then introduce something called the small signal equivalent、uh, circuit,、uh, equivalent half circuit. So let's start with the bipolar differential pair again. So BJT. Diff pair. So we're going to first、um, sort of look at it more like a uh, descriptive uh, method, and then we're going to use small signal model. So at the center, at the balance center, at the center of a transfer curve, which is when V I D is close to zero. So this is、uh, v in one equals to v in two equals to zero. Id equals to zero. This is the at close to the center. So this is what we call the equilibrium point. Once again, this is equilibrium point for differential pair. So this is before when you start playing the seesaw, you level the level the seat, right? Level the bench. So we start at the Balance point. I'm going to plot the schematic again. So I have two transistor match transistors. Q1, Q2, RC, RC. So to think about it in a more descriptive way. So I saw with flatten、uh, a flat. Branch, and then if at this particular balance point, I'm applying a small tilt, I'm start tilting the bench. So meaning that I increase this a little bit, 
This is at its balance point, but it reduces a little bit. So I'm applying a delta V. This is, this is where I'm applying. The dash line is the balance equilibrium point. I have a DC equilibrium point. I don't really care, but I'm applying a minus delta V on the right branch and a positive delta V. Um, the dash line is the balance point. Okay. So if I'm applying a small little signal, what, what would we expect? We expect that there will be a slight increase of the current on the left. So this is the IC1. And let me follow my convention. So on the left, this is IC1. On the right, this is IC2. So we'd expect that IC1 will increase a little bit by how much? By delta IC1. So this is the balance. Its balance point is one half ICC, remember? And then it would then increase by, if you consider this transistor, this being, there's a slightly increase of delta V across, which is VBE increased by delta V. So you expect that the current will be increased by transconductance times delta V. So it's supposed to be true for IC2. It will be a balance point. But then it will be GM. This is highlighted. Uh, this is for Q1. This is GM2 minus delta V. OK? And once again, we know that both GMs, GM1 equals to GM2 equals to GM. I'm highlighting this just to show that this is indicating the transconductance of uh, uh, Q2. Okay? So even though this happens, you see that this plus this will still be IE. It will still remain the same. So if you look at this, even though I'm doing some wiggling of my seesaw, the balance, the average point will still be the same. So I see one. IC2 will still be IE. This is one of the very important points. We're going to uh, come back to that a, a little bit. So this will simply imply that because the total currents feeding through this, feeding through the system, the total current feeding down, there's still IE. This means that this particular point does not, the voltage of this location does not change, even though, even with non-ideal, uh, it, it doesn't really matter what loading you have. As long as these two current balance itself, the same amount is feeding to this uh, IEE, so that this means that this level will not change. If you have whatever IC element, this means that with the differential operation, this suggests that this B remains the same. It doesn't really matter how good this current source is. This level remains the same when I'm operating in differential mode. So let's go back and look at, so what is the supposedly output voltage, differential gain? So your VOD will then become uh, VO, let me highlight it. This is VO1, this is VO2. So if it's defined as VO1 minus VO2, and VID is defined as V in one minus V in two. In this case, my input difference is V in one is two delta V, right? because I'm applying one positive, one negative. And for V01, it will be uh, VCC minus IC one RC minus 
VCC IC2R6. Okay? So the differential output, VCC is the same, so that your overall current will be, a uh, volatile voltage will be IC2 minus IC1. So what is IC2 based on this equation? IC1 minus IC2, let me. We know that the summation is the same, meaning that the average current level is the same, but this will tell me that IC2 minus IC1, based on this equation, is minus GM two times delta V. Okay? Based on that equation, so finally we get our VOD will be minus GM two times delta V plus RC. Okay? So finally, we get our differential gain. By definition, is VID, differential input, differential output. And this will be minus GM RC. Input is delta two. 2 times delta V, 1 plus 1 minus change of your input. And this is your total input, differential input. So your gain will be minus GMRC. Okay? So this is actually the same as a common emitter stage. We'll see why in a minute. Okay, so this is by simply analyzing through transconductance, understanding a little increase and a little de decrease of current then lead to a differential gain of minus GMRC. So as I said, one of the key observations of this analysis is that when I symmetrically increase and decrease this, meaning that my balance, v, when I'm not moving my common mode, here, common mode signal, in this operation, when I'm doing, this is a differential operation, only differential. If I'm only doing differential operation, only differential operation meaning that the increase and the decrease are the same. This means that V in 1 plus V in 2, in this case, will be VCM. So if I'm looking at the small signal, one is plus one is plus delta V, the other is minus delta V equals to zero. So if you only consider differential operation, you're assuming that your common mode, remember V, this is VICM. VICM, if I'm looking only at the small signal part, not the DC component, meaning that one is positive delta V, the, the other is minus delta V, if it balance out each other, meaning that my common mode level does not change, this would then suggest that my current will remain the same. So when common mode is zero, what happens is that VE will remain the same because the current on both sides will always add up to IEE, okay? Meaning that um, only toggle in an equal way of the transit rather than lift it or press it down. So if you think about a seesaw, you're only operated in a differential mode, meaning that how much you lift it, the other side goes down the, e the same amount, meaning that your average point does not change. Therefore, there's no stress at the anchor. So when there's no stress at the anchor, this would suggest that th this potential at this emitter will remain the same if you're operating in differential mode. So this operation suggests that my equivalent circuit, so if I'm doing, I want to emphasize that if I'm doing differential input, if I'm providing only the differential signal for differential signal, if I'm uh, looking at four different, I should say four differential signals, if I'm only consider differential signal on 
p in 1, and v in 2. Meaning that it's average, this will suggest that v i c m is 0. When you're not lifting or pressing down on your apparatus, then it's small signal. You could view, if this is the case, then we could view uh, point E as we call the um, this is like AC ground to another level, meaning that even though it's not really ground, but you could assume it as a ground. We call it virtual ground. It looks like a ground, but it's not a real ground. So we, it will be virtual ground for differential signal. Once again, I want to emphasize only true when you're discussing differential signal, meaning that it's true for VID or your V in VOD. If you're discussing your differential amplification effect, you could assume that it's a ground because it does not change. The overall momentum current is the same. So we assume that VE as a virtual ground. So if that's the case, we could look at a small signal equivalent circuit. You can then construct your small signal equivalent circuit. So we have simply this. This will be R pi. GM V pi. And then this is connected to an RC to AC graph. And this point is E. Let me, this E is shared by the other terminal. This is GM V pi 2. Let me highlight it, GM1 V pi 1. So this is for Q1, the other is Q2. So you will then have also an RC. And this is connected to R pi 2. And I'm connecting this to V in 2. This is V in 1. OK? So that will be my equivalent circuit. So remember, one of the key important observations is that the point E is this. This is the node E. And we assume that we can view it if I'm, applying, if I'm discussing differential signal. I could assume that this E point is virtual ground, meaning that this is, you could look at it as a ground. So if you look at it as a ground, when you fold the circuit over, it's actually identical. The left and the right are identical. So I could actually looking only on half of it. Uh, I didn't highlight my output. So this is VO1. This is VO2. So if you look at the circuit itself, first of all, we know that this point is virtual ground. E is virtual ground. And this half is basically identical to this half. They are identical. So if they are identical, you can only look at only half. You can actually find out the response. So you could actually pick. the left half for analysis because they should have identical responses. So we could actually reduce our equivalent circuit to what we call, because it's a symmetric, so we assume that we only discuss the equivalent 
we're going to make it more simple. We can simplify it even more. So to introduce something called the equivalent half So the equivalent uh, half circuit for small signal analysis will be this. This will be my input. So my input, because I'm only applying mean one, it will be half of my differential signal. Mean two will taking the other half. So I'm going to assume that only half of the input goes to being one. Being one will be half of the differential signal. And then my circuit will be this. This will be r pi. So my equivalent circuit will be, if you look at this terminal, let me highlight it. This is the emitter terminal, which will assume it as a virtual ground. This is the only thing you make. You assume that this is a virtual ground. And this is VCC, which is the AC ground. So you can assume that they're the same ground. Okay. So we're looking at the response of difference of VL, VO1. So you can assume this is the same for VO1 or VO2. So it's equivalent circuit. So VO1 will be minus GM RC V in 1, which will be minus GM RC 1 half of VID. If you, you can actually do it this way. Okay, so VO2, so you get VO1 is minus GM RC VIT. Okay, and VO2 output, the second output, because it's the equivalent circuit, so it should be still GM, a common emitter stage when you apply V in 2. I remember V in 2. If we go back to the definition, V in 2 is 1 half VID minus 1 half VID plus VICM. And we know that we're not considering, we're assuming that common mode signal is 0. So your V in is GMRC minus VID. Okay, so we finally what we get is one half GMRC. Okay, so for differential gain, by definition, once again VOD, VID, so this will be VID, so it will be VO1 minus VO2. So we get minus GM. Okay? It's the same as what we have discussed before. You get the same results. But using a equivalent half circuit, because it's equivalent, should give you the exact results, whether you go to the left route or the right route. So the concept of virtual ground world make our life much easier because we can assume that this particular terminal, if you can view it, the basic shortcut is that if you assume that this is, this is my equivalent half circuit, this is virtual ground. So this is simply a comma emitter stage. So we know that for a common emitter stage, your gain is minus GM. So whatever is being applied, you're applying one half of EID. And this corresponding output will be just um, one half EOD. It's the same. 
and with a gain of minus GMRC. Okay? So next, the next thing we can look at is for a differential amplifier, you look at differential gain, you look at input and output resistance. So we look at the output resistance as well. So the uh, input resistance, sorry. Let's first look at it, its input resistance. So its input The way to look at this input resistance is that you test it with that, uh, with this particular equivalent circuit. So let me draw it out. I'm flipping the current to the top because so, this doesn't really RC GM B pi sorry R pi. We're assuming that it has the same GM, so I'm going to just do the plot. So this is GM B pi 2. B pi 2 is on the right, R pi. So this will be my input when I want to test, because it's a differential input. So when you do the test, you apply a test voltage and look at the test current, okay? Because we're ignoring uh, the channel length modulation, uh, which is the early effect. So this is an ideal current source. You don't actually see the impact of these two. So if you look at this Vx versus Ix, your Vx, this is Ix. What is Vx? Vx is the voltage Vx1. V pi 1 minus V pi 2 divided by Ix. Okay, so this is V pi 1 minus V pi 2. So if you look at the slope, it will be two trans if you look at the circuit, it will be two transistors in parallel. So it's R pi plus R pi. So it's two times R pi. And then finally, eventually you get this this can be represented as two times beta over GM. Okay? So your input this is written will be two res 2r pi in series. Therefore, you get 2r pi's. Okay? It's basically just 2r pi's. So you would then uh, be able to find out this is the differential input resistance of a differential pair. Uh, VJT differential. For MOSFET, it's actually easier because it's, it will be infinite for differential as well. Okay? So, um, we still have like 10 more minutes. I would like to probably go through an example uh, so that you get a sense. We're going to go through an example of a uh, a differential, BJT differential pair in real design and how does it impact its uh, common mode and when you, come, when you discuss its common mode gain and differential mode gain. So we're going to uh, do an overall example. So for a differential pair, we have already analyzed its small signal analysis. And how does one approach to find out its small signal behavior? So let's say if I have a D 
differential amplifier, a differential pair looks something like this. I'm applying a differential signal directly across these two terminals. So the difference between the two will simply be my input. This will be my differential input directly to the base of two tra the, the transistor pairs. And I have a tail current source. In the tail current source, I'm going to use the current mirror idea that we have already constructed before. So I'm going to use a current mirror to construct my tail current source. I'm going to use a look. So this will be a current mirror. I'm constructing a Q2 transistor, Q3, Q4. And then this will be my source. I have a system reference, which is being mirrored out to provide the tail current source. Okay. So if this is the structure I want to look at, let's say this is VO2, this is VO1. It can be operated when I take only one output. That will be a single-ended output. Or I could do fully differential, taking differential output. We're going to discuss the difference uh, in a minute. So first of all, I'm going to set uh, IE to 1 milliamp. And I'm assuming that Q1, Q2 are identical. And Q4, Q3, Q4 are identical as well. So there are basically two pairs, one for Kermier. So the um, yellow part is the Kermier. This is the Kermier. And This is my differential pair. So you should be able to identify the purpose of Q1, Q2. That's the differential pair Q3, Q4. It's the current mirror. So that it can mirror the tail current, the, the current with what we wish to bias the circuit to uh, as a tail current source. So we know that uh, it's differential again. If I'm doing fully differential, which, which is VOD versus VID, it will be it will be minus. We already analyzed this GM RC. It will depend on. Let me highlight it. This is GM one. Uh, GM one equals to GM two equals to GM, which is uh, in this case will be half the half of IE divided by VT. OK? That's my differential gain. We already know what it is. And we also want to look at, so if I want, uh, this will be, if I'm operating as a fully differential under fully differential operation. That will be my differential gain. But what is the purpose of having the tail current source? Is to suppress the common mode gain when, when, when I'm only looking at a particular terminal. So I don't want it to, as I said, if we don't want the signal to propagate, the noise signal to propagate throughout the system, you will, lie, you will then want to investigate what is the B01. If you're only, want, only looking at one side. So if you go back to our definition, if I'm only looking at VO, let's say VO1, it will depend on this differential gain times one half of VID times common mode gain times VICM. OK? So in this case, if I'm only looking at, if I'm only taking out one side, this is called a single end. If 
if I'm doing only single end operation, then my differential gain, because I'm lifting, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at VO2, I'm only looking at VO1, then this will simply be um, times one half the overall your, your differential gain become half of whatever is real, and we're going to look at its common mode gain. So as I said, this is the signal, how much signal is propagating from your differential signal into the output terminal, and how much is being, the noise is being amplified. We we'll we'll want to look at its common mode gain. So as we already discussed, the common mode gain will depend on this resistance of IEE. In this case, the resistance looking down is RO4, right, it's RO4. So your gain, your overall gain should be, your common mode gain should be GM, RC, remember it's one plus GM, two times REE. In this case, the two times REE becomes RO4. Okay, so what is RO4? RO4 is defined as early voltage div divided by IE. Okay? So once I'm inserting all the numbers, this will be GMRC. If I'm ignoring the one, it will be approximately GM two times RO4. And because the GM is the same, so we eventually get approximately the ratio of the loading resistor and underneath RO4. Okay? So you get a common mode gain, which is the ratio between your loading resistors and the output resistance of Q4, which is the current source resistance. So by designing this, we should be able to make sure that my differential gain, so one of the key, I don't really have time to talk about this, but um, give me one minute. So one of the key parameters in analyzing a differential pair is how well does it suppress differential uh, increase. The, remember that the main purpose of having a differential pair is to remain, to keep my differential gain and reduce the common mode gain. So one of the key parameters in evaluating how well do you clean up your signal is that you make sure that your signal is being amplified and the noise is being suppressed. So one of the key uh, parameters called CMR is referred to as the common mode rejection This simply implies as how well does your input stage resist noise and amplify signal? So CMR is defined as differential gain, absolute value of differential gain versus common mode gain. So how much does you remain your overall gain and reduce uh, common mode signal, common mode noise? So in this case, if I'm only taking out single-ended, if I'm considered single-ended operation, because in fully differential, you don't actually see common mode gain because you sub subtract it out anyway. But for single-ended operation, what happens is that your V, your differential gain in this case, it's not the whole because you're only, only receiving half of the signal. So if you consider VO1 as the output, VID as the input, this is the single-end operation. Consider a single-end operation. I 
I have my differential gain equals to one half GMRC. The, the one half comes about because I'm only taking the O1. And my common mode gain is that is um, RC over QR. Okay? So then I get a CMR. We choose the bound. We'll come back to this um, on Thursday as well, but just to give you a sense as to what it is. So it will give you. So this will give us a ratio of four times. Uh, let me just write down GMRC. So the effect of RC will be canceled. Your CMR will be will be approximately four times R O four It should be the ratio between GM and R04, I should say. Cancel the two, and then this is too busy. Let me get a space. Give me a little space. Here. Let me finish this up. So once again, your CMR, common rejection ratio, will be 1 half GMRC divided by 2RO4 RC. So we cancel the RC, cancel the 2, will be GMRO4. So it will be close to a intrinsic gain, but with a ratio. We're going to come back to this uh, on Tuesday. So this is one of the key indicators as to how well a differential pair clean up noise and maintain the signal. So, um, okay.